Welcome to Lecture 2, Technology, the Basics, carrying on from Lecture 1, Consumption, the Basics. So, we tend to think of technology as 21st century objects and the kind of networks powering them and connecting them. Computers, sensors, iPhones, streaming technology, social media platforms, etc. And there's nothing wrong with that, and that's something that will come up often. It's kind of our default way of thinking about technology. These objects generate a really strong feeling of a deep transformation in everyday life. It's really common to hear people say things like, oh, that was before the internet, so we had to use a map. Or, that was before the internet, you had to dial up people on the phone. But even those things are technologies. A map is a technology. A landline is a technology. Um, and it's very common even for, for sort of people in middle age like me to say, oh, I used to have to meet people face to face and you lament the way in which people construct their social worlds now. It's also common to hear things like technology is ruining society, it's ruining education, mm. um, or I need to disconnect for a while. And that's even common among young people. I need to disconnect for a while and get my head together. I need to go off the grid, I need to go offline, etc., etc., etc. And these ideas are really important because they reveal to us the idea that it feels like technology is such a deep part of everyday life now that we can't imagine our lives without it. And we can't imagine extracting ourselves from it because we need to be part of it. It's mm. really essential to just our basic existence and tasks. FOMO. FOMO. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Yeah. Fear of missing out. It's, yeah. it's really important. And I even think about it as someone who, who didn't like smartphones and really resisted having one for so long. And I still don't, you know, I don't use it for email, I don't use it for other things, I try and keep those things separate, but I message people all the time, I look up things all the time, I even buy things on my phone from time to time, though I'm always scared about people stealing my identity. Um, but so even a skeptic like me, I probably couldn't live without it. And I sometimes try and test myself, like, can I get till 11 in the morning before I look at my phone? But... I usually don't make it. No. Yeah. <laughs> is this yeah. the same for you? Yeah, that's right. And I think the thing you're talking about technology there too is like this kind of an everyday common sense idea that technology is something that needs electricity. Yes. And it's not as you said, you know, that's that's technology. That's technology. Like anything, yeah. like you. Um, it's a technology for carrying around water. So yeah, um, I think that's a kind of key way of thinking about. We're talking about technology here. It's not just electronic things. It'll be, um, you know public space yes. in a way like you know or, or roads a road is a, a technology road is a technology uh, the fluorocarbons that make these yep. lights are a technology the electricity that powers the fan now having said all of that I, I, I do I do know in the course we'll slip into talking about our contemporary um, technologies and, and connectivity and digital devices and data etc there will be weeks on that but for the basics I think it's important to take a sort of longer historical view because our contemporary view tends to use what we would say is a bimodal logic, a, a, a world before and a world after, two worlds, two modes, modals. A world before, a world after, world before the internet, world after, world before smartphones, world after, world before kind of computing, world after. But well, it's quite well, important and to have the a third part of the lecture, world before the toilet. The world before the toilet, yeah. exactly, and yeah. toilet paper, yeah. Yeah. and the world after. So we need to consider the deep history of technology as essential to social evolution, how societies have formed, how individuals have been formed, from the wheel to the shoe to the driverless car. These are all technologies that respond to and shape society and, crucially, everyday life. Yeah. So, I have a, a definition of technology here that, that's loose, but it kind of needs to be loose so we can use it well. So, it's an artificial means to introduce natural power in order to achieve a specific objective effectively or at a greater scale. And when we talk about natural power, it can help to think of what we talk about in the kind of science, technology and society literature as hard forces like energy and materials and soft forces like natural phenomena, wind and the inherent properties of nature, etc. Those distinctions don't matter too much, but it can be helpful to think about there's lots of different inputs lots of different kinds of power that go into different kinds of technology. As human societies and technologies have evolved, it gets harder and harder to identify what those inputs are. 
it becomes quite difficult. Like the kinds of things that make the lithium batteries in phones are kind of rare earths and minerals that power different kinds of um, technologies. The crazy statistics you hear about the electricity used to mine for cryptocurrency is the same as the electricity used by the entire state of Finland, for example, is one I read the other day. It becomes harder and harder and harder to find what those natural powers are, how they're introduced to make life work more efficiently or effectively. But a definition like that helps us look, right? And there's kind of two ways in which I think the literature tells us that people have tried to do this. One is to, to focus on instrumentality, so attempts to control human environments. So to make life a bit better, a bit easier. Mm. Toilets. Yeah. So free toilet fridges to, so, you, fridges. so food doesn't go to waste. Yeah. And think about how something like the fridge has changed everyday life. You no longer have to go and buy food every day. Mm. But that also means there's not really much of a market for people selling food every day. And selling food that's just been killed, just been picked, just been caught, etc., etc., etc. It's changed where food can travel from, where it can be sold, what we do when we buy it, when we eat it, and inevitably chuck out mm. in lots of ways. Yeah. So yeah, a technology like that to make life a bit better, same with electricity, same with fans, same with air conditioning, same with, with kind of indoor heating to control the environment and make life a bit better. And they're some of the ones I think we don't pay as much attention to because we're so used to them. Mm. It's only when we're deprived of them which happens yeah. quite rarely, but yeah. we've had some bad storms. Power's gone out a few times. It's like, what? Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. Right? And then to productivity. So it's bringing new things into existence. And here's where, where things like innovation and imagination, and we kind of fetishize the bringing into existence of new things, things that didn't exist before that were beyond our imagination. You watch a video from the 1970s or 1980s, or a movie, sorry, from the 70s or 80s, you'll often see people on video phones. It seemed like this unfathomable technology and now one we take so much for granted that I try to deactivate it when anyone calls me on a video mm. phone for example yep. Yep. so a really simple way technology is human fabrication here we need to make a distinction between sort of natural powers they're used by humans to be fabricated into something else there are complications with that but for basics let's say technology is human fabrication are you okay with that yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, uh, what's, what, what I think we'll be looking at is some of the kind of side effects of these processes as well. Um, you mentioned the lithium battery. I mean, uh, and you're going to talk a little bit about control in a minute. I mean, I would prefer that my phone wasn't constructed through processes of human slavery, mm. which is part of you know mining coltan, which mm. makes our phones. It's in terms of that difficulty of tracing where everything comes from and um, the way that those things kind of enrol these horrible, um, you know social aspects of, of production. Um, technology in that sense is making my life easier, but it's mm. not really like making it that easier for the 12-year-old boy mm. enrolled into human slavery to, and to mine is, the coltan. So it's this kind of backstage of technology consumption that we want to kind of draw out in the course as well. And that's a great point. And this is where we come to this, this, this point, which we'll talk about in a few modules time, about entanglement, that that, that battery in our phone is entangled in all of these other lives and, 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 and worlds. Yep. If you look at the picture on, on the screen, that's a technology in action. It's a buffalo-driven plow. It's a contemporary photograph. This isn't from the olden times. But for that scale of production, for, that, uh, for the kind of society and economy built around that kind of farming, that technology is yet to be improved upon in a dramatic way. Big commercial farming is different, but smallholder farming still depends upon that technology, which has made human life much easier. So technology won't always comply with human expectations and demands. So that's quite important is that the things that we build, we don't always control um, and that there are limits to technological control, despite technology being the product of human invention. Can you think of some examples around this? I mean, I always like to think the idea of the, the artificial intelligence robot that gets out of control and fires you oh, yeah. and launches missiles into your house. But there must be other There's examples too. There's lots of science fiction-y examples that kind of, you know, hoard out dystopian kind of idea of the future. I mean, you know, something like out of control would be something like the production of power and steel leads to things like car, uh, climate change, you know? Yeah. So, you know, these things pump out all the stuff into the atmosphere... Um, it's now largely out of our control in a way mm. of what's going to happen there because we're reaching tipping points and stuff like that. So um, the, 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 um, 
the technology you know producing electricity to make life easier for us is going to kind of you now creating all these kind of out of control um, problems. I think it's a great example, and even even something like the car, which a hundred years ago was a limited technology to a limited number of people, mm. as it spread and become more accessible, become more affordable, as incomes and and social class mobility has changed, and demand for cars have grown and grown and grown. The energy inputs and the destruction that has caused to society, yeah. to geopolitics, etc., etc., et it feels like how did the car become a center of all of this? To the this point now where it kind of has. feels like freedom to have a car. Like yeah. it actually affects the way you feel. People don't want to use public transport, it feels less free. Yeah. Cities have been built around the access to the car, which mm. now is creating all kinds of inefficiencies. And same in the mall, for example, can't exist without the car. Mm. Yeah, you know, that's you right. can't yeah. have a shopping mall without a car. So even the, yeah. coming back to our everyday consumption patterns, depend upon the development of these yep. technologies. So, they're often outside our control, but in that way they're inseparable from human society. And that's an important point and one that we sometimes overlook, in that technologies aren't imposed upon us from above, they're, they're a product of, of human societies. And with high tech, the kind of high technology that exists in our lives at the moment, it can often seem that it's being invented in another planet and then passed on to us to use. We get accustomed to it quickly, etc., etc., etc. But it is not separable from human society, both in its creation, the demand, its use, um, and, and its eventual uh, redundancy and waste. Uh, so we like to call this in the kind of literature a sort of human technological system or a socio-technological system. Those kinds of truncated words help give us the sense that there's something holistic here, something that's not like you have the technology over there, you have the humans here, and someone somewhere, a masterful hand, brings them together. Mm. These things co-evolve, and that's really important to how we think about things in this course. All right. So in the 21st century... A lot of discussions in different fields, from sociology to anthropology to philosophy about technology, have moved on from sort of what is technology to uh, what are the relations or relationships between technology and human beings and society to, more recently, does technology have agency of its own beyond the human intervention and can technology be trusted? And as more and more and more of the non-human gets represented as autonomous or moving, these questions creep more and more and more into our thinking about human society. Um, and can technology be trusted? And this is a question that I think we'll return to again and again and again. But for sociologists, this idea of trust is so crucial and so important. How does technology disrupt or interrupt that question? Yeah, I mean, trust is kind of the thing that you know keeps society together. It's like a glue, you know, when, when you're in terms of technology, we're talking about the car, you know, we, we trust other people on the road so much. It, mm. We're constantly surprised there are more <laughs> car accidents, right? We all know how. But everyone we know is kind of silly and irresponsible, right? But there's like, there's actually, but then in saying that, so many thousands of people die yes. a year on the road. Um, and, and it's like, not something we seem to care about that much. It just seems to be a normal part of life now that like in Australia, hundreds of people die. Yeah. So this kind of, yeah, idea of trust is, uh, is something that I think is a good lens to look at when it comes to uh, technological things because they're so embedded in our day to day mm. lives. We don't think about them that much. But, you know, some would argue that they're not that trustworthy. Our phones, you know, are tracking us. And, yeah. And, and, and our data's being sold. And, like, do, can we trust the consequences of this and kind our, of thing? And our work performance, for example, in lots of different yeah, jobs, yeah, yeah. you know, calculates. Your productivity slipped. It's low. The computer's saying that you're not yeah. performing well. And you're just logging on, logging off. It's your tr yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so a lot of these things that we took for, for mechanisms of trust that were developed through social relationships now have this other kind of... Mm. Um, agency that interrupts or, or goes in between. And that's a really interesting case you brought up about driving in cars, which is the idea of driverless cars is still something I think a lot of people are not willing to trust. No. Yet we fly in planes, which do have pilots, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but are often the, the main command is a computer that, that, that helps fly the plane. Yeah. As you said about cars, I still, I, anytime I actually think through what's happening on a plane, I get very frightened. Yeah. I can't believe that that exists and it happens. But um, again, trying to make the, the everyday strange, you think about getting in this tin can that goes several kilometers up in the air with two people behind a joystick powered by a computer that you hope has no glitches is a pretty huge step of trust, mm, right? right? So what are the things around it that generate that trust becomes an important question. So these questions reflect ideas we'll, we'll return to in the course. Now, it certainly can 
feel like, especially when we do weeks on artificial intelligence, robotics, etc., um, that technology is broken out of the lab and can no longer be tamed. And I think it's useful to always keep that in your mind somewhere about, you know, what is, what is within and beyond our control or within and beyond whose control is important. But that's not necessarily new, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about that in, in the next module. Um, but we think about artificial intelligence, endless data production, drones, which are a frightening reality, and the power of sensors and surveillance. The illustration, uh, sorry, the photograph on the slide here is a picture of, of the Lima 2, which is a robot dog uh, used to enforce social distancing in Singapore during COVID lockdowns. And as you can see, it's highly mobile, it's got cameras on it, it's got sensors on it, and it was able to separate people who are getting too close together, but also use facial recognition um, and biometric databases of citizens to identify people who were breaking COVID rules. It's a military technology, but modified for civilian use. The same kind of technology that produces drones to allow remote warfare, this allowed a kind of remote policing, but in a highly mobile way. But there's something about the way it looks that is quite frightening. And if you saw it trotting yeah. along... It has echoes of science fiction, bad, you know, cyborg -y things that are coming to kill us. Why use this? Why use this to enforce lockdowns during a pandemic? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's not certainly a decision I would um, come to. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, again, it seems to be a, a disciplinary technology, a way of trying to control the masses and things like that. I would imagine that it has some kind of negative consequences for them, the way the populace feels about their government. Yeah, yeah. So they, these things often, when they use control, have, you know... Um, side effects that are not necessarily how the people thought the control was going to work out. Yeah. And I think, in, and in a basic sense too, it removes a, a, a police officer from a risk of contracting COVID and puts a machine in the fray with the control room or the controller being distant. But it gives a different sense, a much more menacing sense of obedience than a, a police officer with whom you could negotiate or bargain or mm. when they've turned around, run away. This thing looks like if you turned around, it'd run after you yeah. and then dissolve you with it. It doesn't appear to be carrying a gun yet. Though. Maybe that's and, the next iteration. And, and you could see how Lima easy that 003, might be. Yeah, imagine. you could yeah. see how easy that might be, and I'm sure that's where the technology comes yeah. from. All right, I'll move on to two things quite quickly. So technology has a long history. We talked about that in, in, in the lecture uh, one. Uh, in the same way as consumption, from Marx to Latour. And there's a great history in the Ryan Gunderson article that I've just cited there. If you're really interested in going into that history of how different social theories have discussed technology, it, it's, it's a really good um, understanding of the more historical version before the present. Um, and there's a fantastic quote from, from Peter Redfield that I've put here, and it's really long, but there's just a couple of bits that I'll point out from it that really sums up the way social approaches to technology help us understand bigger things. I'm just going to go to the bolder bits, that you know, social science studies of technology offers a natural gateway into the spatial distribution of modernity. So, Steve alluded to in the first lecture, who has which technologies where, how much do they cost, how much do they utilise them, how every day have they become, how taken for granted have they become. When we talk about toilet paper even, you can see that that's, not a, that, that's an unequally distributed facet or consumer item of modernity. And so by studying technology consumption in everyday life, we get a sense of the unevenness spatial dis, of the spatial distribution of modernity. The second bold bit I want to point out that it's important to think about um, technologies and machines as not being neutral. They operate amid a welter of climates and encounters, observing and influencing, acting and malfunctioning. And I think this is a really, really crucial point, that they're contextually experienced. So we often like to think of a technology like the phone or the laptop um, or surveillance as being abstracted and the same everywhere and experienced in the same way everywhere. But it's important to understand that they're very contextual and their contextual experience can be very uneven. What they observe, what they influence, how they act and how they malfunction is, is quite contextual. 
And uh, in following such phenomena, one encounters, so we as stu students and, 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 and academics studying technology, a world of natural and social places amid the technical space of science. So what, what, um, what Redfield's trying to remind us for here is that even where technology is pervasive, it's not all encompassing. There are things within and outside technology that are important to pay attention to. Um, and modern technologies rarely keep still, they're constantly shifting and changing, but studying them helps us understand everyday life and society across conceptual and disciplinary boundaries and to think between ideas and actions. The innovation or the idea of the technology is often very different to how it's experienced um, on the ground in everyday life. And the experience in everyday life often modifies that technology, especially as it, as it gets reiterated and rearticulated in later versions. Is there anything you want to add to this uh, idea no. about how to, how to kind of, I guess, recognize the history of technology and a lot of, of social theory and social thinking, and also think about, it adds a lot to what we want to study in, in everyday life, even if we're not technology people. Yeah, then there's a kind of playoff here between technological determinism and like just looking at technology as a way of thinking about broader aspects of the world at the, at the current and time, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, and I think always comes back to context and unevenness, I think are two important things to keep at play. Our experiences of technology are not universal. So, there's some very obvious question, connections between technology and identity. So let's start with the present. If we think of technology as high-end consumer products, then these products are the focus of human desire. We gain a sense of who we are and where our place is in society by our capacity to attain them. Mm. Now, you can buy a phone for $12 a month and be locked in for a really long period of time in another contract, but part of what capitalism is doing is trying to make all of these things much more accessible with their inbuilt redundancies, their, their connection mm. to other plans, etc., 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 etc. So the focus of human desire, and so possessing them is important. And possessing these products gives consumers a sense of identity, of belonging, of modernity, of upward mobility. Is this something you would agree with, especially from a, from a sort of sense around taste and choice, etc.? Yeah, I think you know, technology themselves become key markers of how we think about ourselves and others. They kind of play off between self and social identity. Um, I think, you know, there's people, I think, would even think about people differently if, whether, if they're using an Apple Mac as a Microsoft Surface. People tend to associate various traits around yeah. those things. So they do seem to not directly map on, but there's kind of homologies, I think, between taste and technologies mm. that we'll be looking at throughout the course. It's yeah. a great way to put it. And you know, if you, ever, if you ever have someone you know who ever busts out like a non-smartphone, yeah. it, it has an interesting effect because you, you think that's a very purposeful statement. That's a very, that's a very yeah. purposeful decision, you know, to and there was like. That ironic kind of memes about hipsters you know 10 yes. years ago that like you know would bring a record player with them <laughs> rather than like listen to mp3s and yes. so you know while well, that's kind of a sat satir satiring it kind of shows that there's kind of values tastes morals and ethics attached mm. to technologies just like there is to shoes or records or songs or books yeah that's a great point so uh we use technology also, and particularly the kind of digital technologies that, that, that we're really familiar with now, to curate our identity through networks, media, what we like, where we've been, what we ate, how we look. And this, we discuss this a lot in the course. There's now almost an endless audience for what you ate for lunch. Whether or not anyone will actually pay attention to it or remember it doesn't necessarily change us continually doing it. And that's quite important. So it's not just that having the technology as an object creates our sense of identity, it also helps us curate our identity and spread that around. And we can think of this relationship in another way. Contemporary technology is fundamental in confirming our identity, tracking our movements, our habits, our health, our wealth, our ownership, etc. During the COVID-19 pandemics, we've all had to enroll ourselves in different kinds of technology to mm. confirm who we are, where we're going, where we've been, our vaccine status, where we're in this place at this time, etc. But that's just one of a really long kind of history of enrolling people as citizens through technology, which raises the question of what happens for people who don't have the right documentation, yeah. who don't have access to uh, phones, QR codes, etc. Yeah, or if you've had to help your parents 
set that kind of technology up yes. when they're not great at using it. It creates all these kind of anxieties and stuff like that of people, and you know, not having the freedom to go to a cafe all of a sudden because they can't work their mobile phone. And the frontline worker in the cafe has to go sign in yeah, use yeah. a QR yeah. code. And when someone can't, they have to get out a piece of paper. So yeah. all of that work then is getting passed on to someone. So QR codes, facial recognition, fingerprint swipes, holographic images. If you have a look at, you know, Recent passports have those very prominently. Another biometric data becomes essential for proving who we are, proving citizenship, our right to movement, our right to, to payments and welfare, and taxation, etc., and makes life very difficult for people who are not enrolled or yet to be enrolled in mm. these technologies. So technology and identity have a very kind of um, pragmatic connection as well, beyond just the status. There's a long history of this too. From census data to permanent addresses to family tree diagrams, etc., etc., etc. And finally, the history of this is important, but not something we're going to focus on too much in the course. There'll be references to it here and there. We just want you to recognize that this has a long history. So, technology as consumable products that shape and are shaped by human desire go back a long way. From personal items like radios and cars and televisions to technologies in the built environment. Elevators in buildings, escalators, technologies of movement, traveling by ship versus traveling by plane, that separated people, that separated who was part of modern society and, and who was being left behind. Mm -hmm. And so when materialized as objects, technology affords the opportunity to differentiate and separate self from others, which is why people like to be first to get a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or first to go into yeah. space. Yeah. Well, technologies to then kind of have, you know, like I was with the parents and technology example, they're generational in a way that people how to relate to them. Mm. Um, and yeah, they're key kind of ways that social change is enacted. So we can go even further. You know, if we go back further, clothes made by a machine rather than by hand would have been an important way to differentiate. Whereas now we think clothes made by hand are really expensive items, curated, handcrafted, etc., etc., etc. Books printed in a press and not hand coffee, copied. Plastic bowls that don't break rather than ceramic. And back and back we go. A cart drawn plow over hand turned soil, etc. So the limits here come down to when we believe technology becomes commonly manifest as objects for consumption and when we believe identity becomes an important part of human societies. Very open questions that are very unlikely to be able to be pinned down with any satisfaction, but certainly things to think about and debate. When does identity, especially individual identity, really begin to matter? And it happens in different societies at different times. These are deep, complex, historical, sociological, and anthropological questions beyond what we can do in our course, but just take our word for it. <laughs> the connection is deep and it's old. Yep. Thanks. Okay, we'll, we'll move, move on, on to toilet paper. <laughs>